played by fun-loving kids on street corners. It's played by serious-minded men in multi-million dollar arenas. It's played by the quick and young. It's talked about and cheered about by thousands. It moves quicker than the eye and is more graceful than a ballet. It makes millionaires overnight and turns mediocrity into supremacy. It's played by individuals and by teams. It's played with a big round ball on a long rectangular floor. It's basketball, and there's nothing like it. And that's what today's Spotfield Footlock at Cleaver Clinic is all about. best in basketball. Every one of our players and coaches are champions, starting with the former UCLA coach John Wooden. In sports, everybody has an opinion, but when it comes to college basketball, across the board, everybody agrees on one thing about Coach John. He was the greatest. He is the greatest. It'll be a miracle if there's ever any coach, any time, who is half as great as retired UCLA basketball coach John Wooden. Bringing home a record 10 NCAA championships, Coach Wooden also brought up along the way some of the most talented superstars in the history of the game. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Walton, Jamal Wilkes, Marcus Johnson, Keith Erickson, Sidney Wick, the list goes on. They call him the Wizard of Westwood. It's an honor to have you here, Coach. Thank you, Kenny. I'm glad to be here. Coach, you've influenced some of the top players in college and pro ball, not to mention other coaches around the country. Who inspired you when you were young? Who influenced you and how? From a teaching or coaching point of view, I believe probably it was my father, uh, my grade school principal, my high school coach, and my college coach. But the person who probably had more influence uh, on my coaching profession than anyone else was my high school sweetheart and my wife of the last mm -hmm. 51 years. How did that come to be? Well, she was a great fan and uh, encouraged me when times were bad and was probably more influential uh, than anyone else. Did you play basketball yourself, and how did you become a coach? Yes, I was fortunate in my high school career at one of the uh, fine uh, high schools as far as basketball was concerned in the state of Indiana, and where every team in the state enters the state tournament. And in my three years in high school, we were the runner-up when I was a sophomore. We won the state championship uh, when I was a junior, and we were the runner-up again when I was a senior. I had a great high school coach, a great fundamentalist, and uh, uh, I was very fortunate in being able to play under him. And then at college, I played under probably a man who I feel, in retrospect, was way ahead of his time. That was Ward Piggy Lambert, who's in the Basketball Hall of Fame. And to give you an indication of his uh, ability as a coach, I believe that the Big Ten then was unquestionably the strongest basketball conference in the country. And in his first 25 years there, he won or tied for as many championships as all the rest of the schools put together. So he had to be very good. And he was a... Uh, had so many great ideas that I think were ahead of the time, and I think he was a, a tremendous influence in my coaching philosophy. Now you teach at your basketball camps. You speak all over the world. You've written two books that are almost Bibles on the sport. And you have a philosophy about playing this game that's called the Pyramid of Success. We have a diagram of it here. Can you tell us about it? I'd be happy to, Ken. First of all, this is what we're all after in one way or another. But I'm not sure that we'd all agree in what success really is. Mr. Webster defines it as uh, the accumulation of material possessions or the attainment of a position of power or prestige, something of that sort. I don't necessarily agree with that. After a while, I came up with my own definition, and I choose to define success as peace of mind, which can be attained only through self-satisfaction in knowing that you made the effort to do the best of which you're capable. We can all do that. We, all, we may not be as good as someone else, but we can all make the effort to make the most of whatever we have. I worked for some 14 years developing this, not steadily, of course, but off and on over a period of 14 years. But at the very start, I placed as the cornerstones these two which never changed, industriousness and enthusiasm. And I never saw fit to change those. Many of the other blocks have changed through the years. Some things were dropped out, something else put in. The position was changed, but never the cornerstones. Industriousness. There is no substitute for work. Uh, if you're looking for the shortcut, the easy way, the trick to get something done, you might get it done for a while, but it won't be very lasting, uh, and uh, it, it won't bring you any sort of consistency at all. There simply is no, no substitute for work. And then enthusiasm. I don't see how anyone can possibly expect to make the most of whatever their abilities are unless they like what they're doing. 
Between those two in the base of the structure, I have three things, and they're all similar because they're, they're, they all include others. And if something includes others, I think, Ken, it has to be pretty good. Friendship, friendship, others. Doing something for each other, not someone doing something for you. Friendship you must work at. You can't take it for granted, just as a lot of people take marriage for granted. It won't work. You have to work at it. You have to work at friendship. And then loyalty. There's no question that we have to have something to which or someone to whom we must express and, and, and live and, and, and show loyalty if we're going to make the most of what we have. And then, of course, cooperation. Such a small world in which we live. Modern science and technology is making it smaller and smaller all the time. Uh, by jet travel, we get places before we leave. We've put a man on the moon. We're doing tremendous things in outer space. Uh, we see things that happen now on the other side of the world that uh, when I was your age, Ken, it took us weeks or months and maybe I never saw them at all. So the world is getting smaller and smaller. And, and you, when you stop and think, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, the means of transportation that get us from place to place, uh, the buildings, someone else, we are dependent on others for almost everything. So we must have cooperation. And the surest way to get the cooperation of others is to be cooperative ourselves. Moving up the... Uh, pyramid to the next tier, I have four blocks, self-control, alertness, initiative, and intentness. Self-control. Uh, the, the, the batter that goes to bat mad and all out of control is unlikely to be able to hit up to his uh, potential. Any athlete, any surgeon, any attorney, anyone in any profession that permits their emotions to take over are not going to function anyways near their level of competency. You must keep your self-control. But suppose it's disciplining your children. If you do it with uh, self-control, with discipline, with fairness, remember we discipline only to correct, to prevent, to help, not to punish. If we do it in that manner, we can get productive results. But we must have self-control to be able to make the most of whatever we have. And then alertness. You have to be constantly alert and alive, observing, seeing the things that are going on around about you, and not get lost in your own tunnel vision, because there's something occurring at all times from which you can learn if you're merely observant. And then, of course, the third block is initiative. You mustn't be afraid to fail. You must have the initiative act, initiative to act on your own, because comes a time you're going to have to do that. And if you're afraid to do something, that's the biggest mistake in the world, because you'll do nothing if you're afraid to try anything. You are going to fail. You're not perfect. You must have the initiative uh, to go ahead and act when the, the occasion demands that you do so. And then the last is intentness. That's having a goal that's a realistic goal don't don't make the goals so idealistic they're impossible to attain make them realistic difficult of course uh things easily acquired aren't don't amount to much aren't very worthwhile but you must not let anything deter you from reaching that objective you may have to change your plan you may have to go over around under uh, change the plan of attack but you must not quit you must be intent on reaching that realistic goal and then above we have the very heart of the of the structure of the pyramid three things i think all coaching depends upon getting your players in good condition teaching them not only to properly but quickly execute the fundamentals of the game and then making them play together as a team and then above those we have poise and confidence poise is much like self-control but it's not the same as self-control in my opinion again i have my own definition of poise i choose to define poise as just being yourself a very simple definition you're yourself you're not trying to be something you're not you're not acting if you maintain your poise then you're going to uh, function uh, rather close to your level of competency and then of course all of these things lead up to uh, confidence you must have these in order to have confidence it's real that's not false it's not that whistling in the dark but i'd rather have uh, a little overconfidence than lacking in confidence uh, in almost any athlete if you have these it will lead up to competitive greatness, the, the, the joy, the satisfaction, the, the pleasure derived from being involved in a difficult situation. That's real fun. You don't have to outscore someone or make the sale or beat someone else in any idea. It's just the joy of competition. The real competitor enjoys that. And then just above the competitive greatness leading up in this structure from the corners of the, of the block, competitive greatness, we have faith and patience. Faith and patience. We must have faith that things will work out as they should, as long as we do what we should. And we must realize that good things take time, and we must have patience. These things all lead up to the apex success, according to my own particular definition. Now, Coach, as far as skill goes, can you demonstrate some of the drills you put your players through? Indeed, I can, Ken, and I have some players over here to help me. 
can sense uh, the success of any sport depends upon not only the proper but quick execution of the fundamentals, and it's impossible to have that without balance, I'd like to discuss the one item I think that I stress more than anything else early in practice every year. I did this when I was actively coaching. I do it in my summer camps, and I would at, uh, coaching at any level. Balance, the physical balance, uh, cannot be uh, attained and maintained without mental and emotional balance because the player who loses his uh, emotional control certainly is not going to execute well and you have to maintain a mental balance in order to keep your emotional balance. Now the physical balance is controlled by the extremities of the body and they'll only do according to the messages that they receive of course uh, from the brain. Since the game is played on the feet, we'll start with the feet. The feet should be just wider than the shoulders. Now, if you get the feet too wide, you slow down your movement, and if you get them too close together, you will not have a good balance. So the feet are the most important part. Uh, I always say that uh, I feel that uh, socks and shoes are the most important part of equipment because the game being played on the feet. Now, the next uh, thing that we must take into consideration is the head. Now, I want the head directly above the midpoint between the two feet. If you drop your chin, the head comes forward, and the, we know the head is made up of bone on the outside and brain on the inside, and that's water, almost entirely water, heavy substances. And if you drop the head, the mere weight of it being at the end of the body will cause you to lose balance. So the chin must be up and directly above the midpoint between the two feet. Now the third extremity that I'd like to speak of is the hands. The hands should always be close to the body. If you're on offense with the ball, the ball should be kept close to the body. From here, you can start the quick dribble, the pass, the shot, whatever's necessary to do if you keep them close to the body. If you drop them or get them out away from you, you limit the number of things that you can do. So the hands must be always close to the body. Without the ball, the hands must be close to the body. When you're on defense, the hands must be close to the body because if you reach, you're losing a little bit of balance. So those are the things that we uh, start with. Now between these extremities, we have the joints. Every joint must be flexed and relaxed. If the joints aren't flexed and relaxed, if you, if you lock any joint, you again impede your movement. So let's remember to keep the feet just wider than the shoulders, the head directly above the midpoint between the two feet, and the hands always close to the body. In that position, I think you're always ready to execute the fundamental, not only properly, but quickly. A good basketball offense is predicated on the ability of the players to make quick and proper exchanges of the basketball and then moving after they do something. One of the cardinal sins in an offense is passing and standing. You must make a move, a clever move, something that uh, will be constructive after you've uh, passed the basketball. Now, the ball, ball handling is not just holding the ball. It's passing the ball, receiving the ball, dribbling the ball, shooting the ball, any of the various things that you might do with the basketball. When you have the basketball in your possession, the fingers must be well spread and uh, the palms must not be touching the ball, uh, the ball at all, uh, primarily with the fingertips, although the pads might be touching a little bit, but not the palms. Now, the exchange of the basketball is uh, uh, based on getting it by the defense, not over the defense, not around the defense, but by the defense. Let's use the quick one-hand push pass, right and left hand, mixing it up. Quickness, let's remember that balance that we spoke of, the knees, flexed, the head up, the uh, head directly above the midpoint between the two fleet, hands close to the body. Now the receiver should always open their hands uh, toward the ball. When you are a potential receiver, those hands should always be up toward the ball and giving the target. Now let's use the two-hand overhead pass, which is used occasionally. Now this should go straight above the head and then be re released with a snap of the wrist and fingers. Occasionally, players make the mistake of rocking uh, illustrate what I mean by that, uh, uh, Keith, rocking back. That's what you must not do. The ball is uh, brought directly overhead and released quickly and should be at the chest of the receiver. Actually, the receiver should always give a main target with one hand or the other where they want it, but the other hand is there too because you must receive the ball with two hands. Now we also use the bounce pass. The bounce pass should hit the floor three quarters of the way across. The bounce pass should come above the knees but below the waist. If it comes up uh, to the shoulders, it's entirely too high, or up to the chest. Now, it must be quick. 
Now, preceding every pass, I like to have fakes. I haven't spoken of that, but I don't necessarily mean ball fakes. I mean quick head fakes, slight ball fakes, just with the wrist and fingers. If you want to pass under the defense, you give a slight head fake up. If you want to pass over the defense, you give a slight head fake down. Uh, you must pass quickly. The ball normally should be parallel to the floor. What you're trying to get the defense to do is freeze momentarily, and then you can get the, the, the uh, uh, ball away uh, without uh, problems. We must remember that in both passing the basketball and shooting the basketball, you pass by the defense. Don't try to pass over the defense or around the defense. You pass by them. Now, the same thing in shooting. You don't try to jump over a man. You shoot by him. You can shoot before he can relax. Uh, the hands, remember, spread uh, toward uh, the, for the receiver, toward the ball. The uh, passer must keep his eye on the target. Uh, he may fake, faint, use the head fakes and body fakes. I never like too much ball fakes, but getting the, the ball away quickly past the defense. Very good. <laughs> Since the jump shot is the most uh, used uh, shot in basketball today, and I think uh, teams uh, live or die by their ability to hit the good percentage of the sh jump shot, I'd like to uh, have this young man illustrate what I believe are the main fundamentals that I want in taking the jump shot. First of all, that balance. Bill, get the uh, feet wider than the shoulders, uh, have that good uh, balance, the head directly up. Now, eye on the target. It's essential that you keep your eye on the target, but I don't like you to stare at it, but I want the eye on the target. Now, as you come up to shoot, I want the elbow to be directly above the knee, which of course is directly above the foot, and the hand directly above the elbow. I do not want you to drop it back here. Now, I've known some good shooters that way, but that is not the way we would uh, teach it. Now, we want a quick explosion as you go up. Without letting the ball go, I'd like for you to illustrate a quick explosion, Bill. That's it. You do not try to get too high. You do not shoot over the defense. You shoot by the defense. Now, just before you shoot, I like for you to give up the little head fake to sort of get the defense to freeze. If you can get them to freeze, I think your chances of getting the shot away successfully uh, have been appreciably increased. So let's give me the idea again without uh, actually letting the ball go. Don't reach. All right, now let me take the ball, and you do it without the ball right now, Bill. Now, I want the elbow completely extended and the wrist and fingers to snap, and then bring the hand back here. Don't let the hand go out, all right? Now. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Bill. This is a jump shooting drill that we use from the baseline, either side of the floor, and off a little where we use the board, and then out in front where we use the quick jumper, and sometimes fake the quick jumper and take the one drive and come up with the jumper. Now, it's very important that we're working on passing and receiving while we're working on shooting, because without good passing and receiving, we're not going to get good shots. Now, remember the things, the techniques. Keep your good balance all the time. Keep that ball close to the body. Let it go quickly but not hurriedly. Be quick, but never hurry. Let's go, Bill. Good passing every time. Good receiving. Have those hands up and ready. Be sure you reach up. Follow through. The head must follow through towards your target. The head more or less follows the ball. All right, let's come over here now and take the same thing off the board. Now, not too quickly. I want you to be quick, but never hurry. Under control. I like that quick reaction after you shoot. That's the way to be in there after, Bill. Keep that ball close to the body. Close to the body. All right, young man. With me to help illustrate some of the key points in regard to rebounding, I have Keith Erickson. And I'm sure that most of you that might be watching this will know Keith Erickson, but you won't know him like I do. He was a very, very key member of my first two national championship teams at UCLA in 1964 and 1965. He's one of the greatest competitors I've ever seen in any sport and is really a tremendous athlete. He went on uh, after he graduated from UCLA and had a tremendous pro career and is now, of course, working for the LA Lakers. Uh, Keith, you will remember that my ideas in regard to rebounding were a little bit different than a lot of them, and I'm not sure that you always agreed with them. I feel that the most important thing about rebounding is assume the shot will be missed. I don't believe it's jumping ability. I don't believe it's strength. I don't believe it's blocking out. 
I think it is assumed the shot will be missed. The second is to get your hands above your shoulders. I've seen too many players come in to rebound with their hands down here to try to get more height, and then someone crowds them and their hands are caught and they don't get up at all. And the third thing is go get the basketball. Want the basketball. When you're offense, you move quickly, throw an arm, and go by the defense after that basketball. If you're on defense, you try to step across or swing back in front of the defensive, of the offensive player and try to beat him to the ball. I think there's too much waiting. I think there's too much trying to hold the other fellows out. Now you have to hold your position when you're down underneath, of course, but I'm talking about from outside. Keith, I want you to take the ball and do a uh, uh, something like we did to UCLA so many times. I want you to throw the ball up on the board and jump up and get the rebound, illustrating how I want you to get the wide leg spread and come down in good balance. Throw it up there softly. Now go up and get it. Okay, wide leg spread, good balance, where that no one can bump you. You know, occasionally players get bumped and they travel and they said he pushed me. You're never pushed if the official doesn't call it. So I want that good balance in there. I like the ball close to the body because if you keep it out there, a hand gets in there, you run a good chance of losing it. So you keep it close to the body. Now once getting the ball, of course, the most important thing is to make the good pass out. So as you come down with the ball, I want you looking over your shoulder out to the side from which you uh, get the ball. If you got it from the other side of the goal, you look that way. All right, let's do that again and come down and be looking for the good pass out. Good balance, good possession for the good pass out because we haven't gained much until we get that ball down at the other end and we want to get it out, get the fast break going, but we must get there safely. We want to have the ball with us all the time. Once again, Keith, now remember, he has assumed the shot will be missed. He has had his hands above his shoulder and he's gone after the basketball. Let's come in from just a little farther out now and do exactly the same thing now, just a step or two in. Close the body now. Good, good protection, that's good. I like that good balance. You always have good balance, Keith. Although, in my opinion, it takes much more time to teach offense than it does defense because of the fact that in offense you have to teach uh, to shoot the various types of shots, to pass the ball, to receive the ball, to dribble the ball, to do various things with the basketball. Defense is equally important. As a matter of fact, I feel that most championships in almost any sport are won on defense. Now, I'm going to show a few of the things. Uh, obviously, we don't have time to cover many things, but I'm going to show a, sh a few of the things that I stressed in playing defense in basketball. We must remember that you have to have that good balance. You must not reach. You must stay low. You must never cross your legs. You must keep your legs just wider than your shoulders. You must always keep one hand pointing toward the person you're guarding and one hand toward the ball and be ready to move in any direction. Now we're going to talk about defending against a forward over here. We're assuming that the guard on the far side of the floor now has the basketball. So you should be pointing toward the basketball with one hand and toward the man you're guarding over here who would be moving. As the ball would come from there to the guard on this side, you would come behind and then come up. Now let's move back and pass the ball in there at this, as the ball comes into the forward and I want you moving here and up. All right, now, low, stay low. You must not permit him to drive this baseline on you. I want you to split this leg a little more, the outside leg a little more. I want this hand up in the passing lane toward the post. This hand to stay right up here in the passing lane toward the post, and this hand down against the dribble to the outside. Now remember, in guarding forwards, defending forwards, we must not give up this baseline drive. We'll drive them across. I want you to make them uh, um, take an arc rather than let them getting a diagonal cut, because diagonal cuts will kill you. Pass back, back up, opening up, back to the forward. Come over and up, all right, back. Whenever a ball is passed, you back up fast toward the basket, but keep pointing toward the man you're guarding. Don't take your eye off him. Back again. All right, position. Back. All right, move back. Now keep that head right in between where you see both man and ball, with one hand pointing toward the man, one hand toward the ball. All right, back to pass back. Now move over and up. Protect this baseline. Don't let him have the baseline. Back in. All right, now hold it right here. If the ball should go on over to the other guard, then he backs up further. And if he should go into the other forward, he would go all the way into the three-second area. Position is so important, but you have to back away from your man, play defense in relation to where the ball is and where the basket is and where your man is. All are very important.
defensing the post uh, is, in a sense, just like defensing a forward and defensing a guard. You have to take into relation uh, as to where the ball is, where the postman is, and where the basket is. So you must keep that, always keep those three things in mind, the ball, your man, and the basket. Now with the ball on the strong side, and we're thinking primarily strong side now, which means guard, forward, and post on one side of the floor. With the ball with the guard on the strong side, we want the postman up on the strong side with the open hand in front of the eyes, back close in as possible uh, to the postman. Now, if the ball should, by any chance, go to back to the other guard, then we'd like him to swing this arm, come in close behind, and get to the other side and do exactly the same thing. Now move back again to the other side. Now let's say the ball should happen to go into the forward over there. The postman would drop back quickly, get this hand in front, get this hand in front, back quickly, helping deny the pass from the forward. All right, back again in this position. Now let's say that the ball comes from that guard into the post. Immediately, I want the defense back, arms distance away, reaching arms distance, where then he can uh, prevent the man from making a turn, quick drive on him, where he has him covered, and if he turns and faces the basket, I want the inside hand up and the outside hand down. Inside hand up, uh, flicking it in front of his eyes, and the out outside hand down. All right, back again. Pass the ball back out. Get your position over there. Let's, say, let's assume it goes to the forward over there. Flick the ball over to the forward. All right, back out. All right, let's assume it goes over here. Get around quickly. All right, back in position again. Let's assume it comes into the post. Get your position quickly. All right, now those are the essential things that you must keep in mind at all times in the man-to-man -man defense that I think are extremely important. The man you're guarding, the position of the ball in relation to the basket and the basket itself. In defending the opposing guards, we must keep the same principles in mind that we uh, keep in mind in defending against a postman or defending against a wingman, a forward, uh, or any other position. You have to know where the man is, where the ball is, and where the basket is. You play him uh, tight in relation to how far he is from the basket, uh, and so on. That must be kept in mind. Now, with the ball here, we like the uh, defense to split the inside leg of the guard because we want to drive guards outside. Never let them drive straight down the middle here because that throws tremendous pressure on the defense. So we like to drive them outside and make them come around an arc and that's going to take them longer and give the defense a chance to slide across in front of them. Now we don't want the defense to reach, we want the inside hand, the inside hand to be a, a, a deterring factor as far as getting a pass into the postman in here and the outside hand to be a deterring factor as far as the dribble drive. Now if he passes over to the other guard, we'll say over there, this defense backs up with a hand in front of the postman and uh, uh, he is to stop any bounce pass into the post. When he's out here, if this man has it again, this hand is to stop a straight pass into the post. If it goes to the other guard, he drops back, and that hand is to stop a bounce pass into the post, and this hand pointing toward him. All right, back out again as if he has the ball. Now if he passes into this forward over on this side, he backs up where he can see both, one hand always toward uh, the man and one hand uh, uh, toward the ball. And you'll notice he's never taken his eye off his man. Never turn and look at the ball. That's what drives coaches uh, uh, gray-headed much too soon. You must never take your eye off your man. You drop back quickly. Now it comes out again. He's up in good position in here. Now also, he must be, when this man has the ball, he must be very careful about screens that are coming up from behind. And if, he, if his teammate calls a screen coming up, he should open up, drop this foot, and open up. Now it makes it very difficult to be screened in here if he opens up. If he didn't open up, if he, if he kept up there higher, he could be easily screened. So he must learn to open up toward the screens and of course his teammates must talk and let him know. It's a question of working together. Basketball is just like everything else. It's a question of the people working together. If each one does their own job, if they're uh, familiar and able to quickly and properly execute the little fundamentals, you're going to get very, very good results of course commensurate with abilities you have as against the abilities of your opponent. But the thing is, work together and come as close as possible to your own level of competency. Good, Coach. Thank you, Ken. It seems like teamwork gets a lot of emphasis. What about the superstars? Was Kareem a team player? Oh, Kareem was the epitome of team play. I think uh, his great strength, the thing that made him probably the most valuable player in the history of the game was the fact that 
he was a great team player and was very maneuverable. Not only was he well over seven feet tall, but he could really maneuver. And I think that uh, those qualities, along with his heights, what made him uh, really the uh, tremendous player that he is. What would you say is the most important thing Kareem learned at UCLA? From a physical point of view, uh, from the basketball angle, I think maybe it was just getting better at the various things. He, he developed his hook and became a little better on that. He developed his defense. He developed his block, uh, uh, shot blocking ability. Uh, he developed uh, many, uh, in many of the fundamental aspects of the game, but really where he developed more than anything else was, I feel, uh, uh, socially, uh, emotionally, and mentally. Not that he wasn't very bright, because he was very bright, has a high IQ, but uh, he uh, sometimes felt that he was being picked upon, sometimes because of his size, perhaps, and I think there were times even when he felt that uh, uh, he was picked on a little bit because of his race. And I think that as time went by, he, he grew up, uh, he matured, and there's where I saw the greatest change in him while he was at UCLA. Would you tell that story about Sidney Wicks and his hair problems before his senior season? Well, Sidney was quite a character in so many ways. And uh, he, uh, after um, Al Cinder and Jabbar graduated, he knew that, uh, Sidney knew that we were going to need him very, very much uh, the next year. And he and another player on the team, uh, Steve Patterson, they knew that they were going to be much more important to the overall success of our team the next year as far as uh, scores were concerned. And uh, they knew that I didn't permit excessive uh, 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 length of the hair. They knew I didn't permit mustaches and beards and excessive sideburns. And they came to the first day of practice with huge mutton chops, which had been growing since the season ended the year before. And uh, they knew I didn't uh, permit that. And I knew they were testing me, but uh, I was there as they were drawing equipment and I wouldn't let them have any. And Sidney said, no, how come? And I said, you know, uh, how come? And if you don't know, you have no business being here. And I said, uh, you have 15 minutes to get up to the training room and take advantage of the razor and the clippers, and, and Ducky Drake, our trainer, can fix you up, uh, and that will determine whether or not you're going to play uh, basketball for UCLA, UCLA this year. And he stared at me and, and tried to look real tough, and I said, you have about 13 minutes left, Sydney. You better get going. <laughs> so he turned and went up and got fixed and uh, came down in good shape. and. We had our practice that day, and to close of practice, uh, Sidney said, Coach, I want to talk to you, man. And I said, fine, Sidney. And, and uh, he said, uh, I'm sorry that I caused you a little trouble. And I said, no problem, Sidney. And he said, I do want to ask you a question. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, would you really have, have let us go? And I said, well, what do you think? And he said, well, uh, I, I got fixed up, didn't I? And I said, yes, you did. And I said, I guess that answers it. And I said, I'd like to ask you a question, Sidney. What would you have thought of me had I given in to you? And he said, not very much, coach, and he turned and went away, which uh, certainly proves that uh, the youngsters will take discipline. And no player is bigger than the team. They can't be. Yeah. Well, coach, that was great. Is there a last thing you'd like to say to the young players watching this who might be dreaming of a career in basketball? Ken, it is all right to, to think of becoming an outstanding athlete in some sport, but don't make that your goal. There's going to be a very, very small percentage of you, of the, the thousands throughout the country that will be able to, to become outstanding in, in a sport. Enjoy it. But remember, you're not in school for sports. That is an avocation. You, you must work on your studies. Become a good student. More and more, that is becoming important. And you, you're going to need to make better grades to be able to be accepted in a college or university of your choice. Work hard on your grades. That must be first. I used to tell my players at UCLA, your first objective here is academic progress toward a degree. Your studies come first. Second, I want basketball. Third, that can be social activities uh, as much as you have time uh, for. Some will have more time than others, but never put other things ahead of your academic progress. Uh, please try to understand that, young man. That's the best advice that I could give you. Before we wrap up, we want to thank former UCLA and Lakers star Keith Erickson and Bill Johnson and Bill Burgess for their able assistance. And once again, John Wooden, it's been a real privilege to have you here. It's been my pleasure, Ken. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, gang, for today, that's the way the ball bounces. It's been fun for me, and I hope you've learned a thing or two about this fantastic game they call basketball. Until next time, for every one of us in the Southfield Footlocker Basketball Clinic, this is Ken Bredsang, so long. <laughs>